Well, Jessica Groves' attorney has begun his cross-examination of the CPS caseworker, asking her about her background and training, how she takes reports, and so <coughs> forth. As I mentioned, forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan is joining us this hour live via Skype. Good to have you here, Joseph. Um, so let me start with you talking about uh, the investigation into this baby's death. We heard the CPS worker say the last time she ever saw the baby was March 28th. The couple, when they finally were apprehended, tried to say that CPS had taken the baby, but that was not the case. And then his little corpse was not found until sometime in June. So we don't know exactly when the date of death was, but we have to imagine, based on testimony uh, or, or uh, an interview given by Daniel Groves at some point that the baby died sometime in March, that several months had elapsed. How does that lapse in time complicate the investigation, if at all? It is, oh, by the way, good morning. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Uh, it, it is, it, it throws a huge wrinkle into the investigative process because what you're trying to establish is a timeline. That's what we work upon. Tom, Tom is essentially the, the coin of the realm when it comes to investigations because you can kind of marry up what the suspect is saying along with these benchmarks along a linear timeline, which is the way I try to teach it. Uh, when I'm instructing police officers and certainly my students at Jacksonville State, uh, because that is how you frame everything. Uh, and just to go back and kind of orient people, sometimes when you're dealing with cases like these, I, one comes to mind for me in particular that I worked as an investigator in Atlanta, I'm sorry, in New Orleans, uh, and it involved a family that were deeply involved in drugs. This is back during the days of when crack cocaine was so prevalent, uh, we documented that a one particular family with two kids, uh, one wound up dead, um, actually moved uh, 28 times in one year. And the problem that this poses for investigators and for caseworkers is the fact you can't, th these are people of free will, so you can't keep your finger upon them at all time. It's not like they necessarily have some kind of tracking bracelet on them or anything like that. All you can do is go to the last known address and check in and see if they're there. And these people will attempt to deceive you. Uh, they're wanting to put as much distance between you and the truth and what the reality is about the life that they're living with these kids, of course, who we all want to try to protect. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. And in terms of that point on deception, they will deceive you. I mean, clearly these people were giving the CPS worker the real runaround, not responding to texts, not being home. But then when they're finally found, they say, oh, we gave the baby up to CPS. I mean, is that yeah. even an act of deception? If obviously, Terry, authorities know that they did not take the baby, you know, I mean, that it's like just throwing anything at the wall. What, what was your take on that when you heard that they told investigators, oh, CPS took Dylan? You know, it's interesting. They are definitely trying to deceive the authorities by saying that CPS took them. And I noted that the, you know, social worker, she actually felt for Dylan. You heard her say the last time she saw Dylan was in March of, you know, yeah, that year. Yeah, we heard her break down a little exactly. bit. Exactly. We heard her break down. So blaming, you know, Children's Services when in fact they were really trying very hard to take care of the baby, I think is shameful. That is Daniel Grove's attorney doing her cross-examination of the CPS worker. Now, uh, we've heard a lot about what has led up to baby Dylan's death, the, the lack of care, the neglect on the part of the parents. Uh, soon, though, I expect that the testimony will shift to the discovery of baby Dylan when he was eventually found in the bottom of that 30-foot well uh, in June, potentially months after he was killed. Uh, I want to bring Joseph Scott Morgan in, our forensic death investigator. And Joseph, we talked about sort of what happens when the time has elapsed between a murder and when the body is found like this. But let's talk about the nature of the way this couple disposed of the body. And they admit to it. Daniel Groves, too. Yeah, he said he had nothing to do with the murder. But yes, it was his idea to put the baby in the, the uh, well. And then one of the attorneys said to build the coffin. I don't know if you could call a milk crate that had the baby wrapped up in it and weighed down a coffin. Let's talk about uh, some of the forensics involved when law enforcement d did find that baby. Yeah, I, I don't think any any uh, right-minded jury in the world would uh, would uh, you know interpret that as a coffin. Uh, that's certainly way off the beam there. Uh, you know, uh, this child was placed. Not only was the child wrapped in plastic, and I'll get into some of the nuts and bolts here. The child's body was wrapped in plastic 
sealed with duct tape, and then placed into a milk crate. If uh, the folks at home are not familiar with this, it's it's plastic. It's kind of got a web design to it. Handles on each side, hard plastic, and then then the the crate itself containing the baby was weighted down with like padlocks and chains and all this thing, kind of a, a homemade anchor, if you will, mm. and then drop into the bottom of this well. Now, I don't know how deep this well was, and I don't really know what turned the yeah. police onto the well. But I do know this. Because the body Just, was so well sealed. Yeah, Joseph, I'm going to have to cut you off there, but I know you're sticking around. Angelica Spanos is coming up next. Thank you to Joseph. Thank you to Terry Austin. Stay with us.